Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining this learning experience brought to you by Palo Alto Networks. My name is Cody and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. Before we dive in, we do have just a couple of notes I'd like to review with everyone. First of all, we are recording our session today. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to watch again at a later time, or if you'd like to share with the rest of your team, we will be sending you the on-demand recording shortly before, or shortly after we conclude this live session today. Now, if you would like to get involved with our conversation today, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first option is to use the chat tab on the right side of your screen. So when you find that chat tab, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you are joining from today. I see New York City, Ghana, London, Munich. So we are coming from all over today. Now, if you have specific questions, we do want you to send those to the Q&A tab on the right side of that chat section. Sending your chats to that Q&A just helps us keep track, and we want to be sure to answer as many of your questions as we can, um, so be sure to submit those to that Q&A portion. Additionally, we have a whole bunch of handouts there for you, so if you'd like to grab all those, do so throughout our program at any time. And finally, we will be selecting two of our most engaged attendees to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So ways to become eligible are sending in your chats, your questions, and of course, filling out our post-webinar survey that is also included in the handout section. So our conversation today is around the ultimate guide to, con to container security, tips and tricks for success. I'm joined today by Gareth Baruch, Global Solutions Architect at Prisma Cloud and Palo Alto Networks. And we are also joined today by Mohit Basin, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Prisma Cloud. So Gareth and Mohit, thank you both so much for joining us today. Mohit, would you like to get our conversation rolling and kick us off? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Thanks for having us. Um, so my name is Mohit, everyone. Nice to meet you. Today, we'll be talking, like, Gareth, like Cody said, everything about container security. Before we actually talk, about container security. Let me give you the basics of what is containerization, container architecture, and how to look at it from a security standpoint. Then Gareth's gonna cover uh, security for containerized environments and how you can leverage Prisma Cloud to help you solve all your container security needs. With that, let's get started. So let's go over the basic of container architecture and let's talk about why is contain what is containerization and why is it important? So, as we know, with the use of um, applications going from monolithic to more microservices, we started using containers because then we reduce the amount of dependencies you need for an application to run because it's all contained in one package, and you can also reduce the need for dedicated hardware. In the past, when you would uh, build an application, maybe set it up for whether it's testing or QA, you would have the individual who is testing it or QAing it download all the dependencies, all the firmware, as well as <clears throat> all the libraries needed and install it on their machine, as well as the application so that they can run the application and try it out for themselves. But with containerized applications, because everything is packaged in one place, it makes these things a lot easier and you just hand over the containerized application to the individual who's QAing or testing the application so that they can they don't have to download and install all the dependencies or packages. And the difference, there's a few differences between containers and virtual machines. Um, you know, the fact is that both use hardware, but they have a difference in terms of what is being used to run the actual containers versus the virtual machines. And containers are a lot more lightweight in terms of resource consumption, whereas VMs are heavy and have dedicated resources for specific processes. And then another major difference is that all containers share the host operating system, whereas each VM runs its own operating system and has the ability to run its own operating system. That's different from the actual host machine's operating system. And the containers virtualize the operating system, whereas the virtual machines have hardware level virtualization. And because containers are all packaged in one place, they're easy to start up, shut down, 
as well as scale up and down. Whereas virtual machines take more time to assemble, put together, as well as start up the application. And the other last two things is containers require less memory space, whereas virtual machines require more. And containers isolate the process to, spe to specific containers or pods. And this is potentially less secure, whereas virtual machines are fully isolated, especially through the hypervisor. And the basics of containerization is, like I said earlier, less resource overhead because they don't require much resources, especially don't rely heavily on the operating system of, of the host. And then they're also very portable because containers are built for microservices applications. They can easily be deployed amongst different operating systems and hardware platforms. And like I said earlier, it's easier for DevOps teams to build applications with containers because they don't have to worry about incompatibility or performance issues that they might run into when they're actually building, testing out, or QAing the application. And containers are very easy to scale up or down. You could add more containers. If your microservice application requires requires more containers for more processing, you can add more containers. You can also remove them very easily. And then last but not least, container security, the main topic of our discussion today. You know, inherently, uh, you think that because containers are isolated, they'd be more secure, but it's not always the case. The deployment of, and development of containerized applications can be secured through a different process of you know, catching things early on, as well as looking at things at one time. And here's a few common use cases that we see customers uh, using containers when they actually build out containerized applications. The basics is the lift and shift where they take an existing application and migrate it to modern cloud native architecture, or they might actually refactor the actual application where they restructure the code the different components of the application needed for itself and then move it into a containerized environment so you can actually benefit from the from the benefits of having containers versus having like a traditional vm based heavy application and then last but not least a lot of new containers are just being built from the ground up for new applications where it's just being built in the cloud natively to develop cloud native applications And there's a lot that goes on in an actual container and its environment. And I'll, let me cover that today. So like I said earlier, you still have physical infrastructure in a container, and then you have a host operating system. That's actually the operating system that's running on the machine. And then you have a container engine that runs the actual container, starts and builds it and sets it up. And then you have an orchestration engine. An orchestration engine is kind of like a, a Kubernetes, uh, something that actually manages the container and the application. So when you actually start a container, it's actually two different things. Uh, the container engine grabs a set of files or images that are stored in a container repository or a container uh, registry and pulls that down. And then when it pulls that down, it then takes all those images, unpacks it, builds it, and builds the actual container and the application. Now, the host operating system is still an important part of this. Uh, certain containers rely on base layers of host operating systems, and there, the host operating system in that case provides access to the actual physical infrastructure running and then is another layer and you can have plenty of different types of host operating systems like you know uh, rancher os bottle rocket mariner photon and then your usual linux distributions as well Let's talk more about the building blocks of containers. Um, like I said, the container environment is built upon two key Linux building blocks, the namespace and the control group. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because when you put the namespace and control group together, you can securely run multiple applications within a single host. 
And this is a fundamental property on the container because the control groups limit how much you can see and the container namespace can also limit what you can see. Now, namespaces are a way for Linux to provide isolation for the processes running, as well as what access they have to system resources. And namespaces pretty much create a virtualized, isolated user space and gives an application dedicated resources, such as file systems, network stack, process IDs. And this allows the application to run without impacting the other applications running within the same environment, but on a different namespace. And it pretty much abstracts the user space to allow each application to run independently without interfering with other applications on that same hardware and that same host I mentioned earlier. Now, a control group is more of a Linux kernel feature that limit, limits and isolates processes for accounts and resource usage. Now, control groups are awesome because then they allow how much resources your containers are using, as well as how they're prioritizing certain processes and, and determining, hey, if two containers are competing for the same resources, which container gets what. And then they also do some basic accounting where they monitor different levels of resource usage. Now, there's different types of containers and how they're usually being ran. Most common containers are application containers. These are what run your databases, your backend, your front end, things like that. And then you have operating system containers as well. And the real only reason why I cover this is because these are just different types of containers. An operating system container might actually run a fully virtual operating system um, and they might share part of the kernel, but you'll have a variety of containers that you run into. And each container is has a specific purpose as well. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the actual elements of a containerized application. The you'll hear you'll hear a few different terminologies being used uh, later on in this presentation. That's why I want to cover what is a container image, what's a container registry, and what's container runtime. Now, like I said earlier, containers are a set of resources that are all packaged together. And they're done through through different images. And the container image is the actual package application along with all the dependencies needed for the application to run. And what happens is when you build a container, you pull the container image from a container registry. And a container registry is a repository or a collection of repositories that stores images used for development operations. And registries can be public or private. So what happens, let's say you're using Docker in this case, that's a container runtime. The Docker container runtime is gonna pull the container image from a certain registry. It's gonna use that to actually build and execute the application. And the reason why I talk about this is because in modern, develop, in, in modern development processes, this is what happens, they usually have different images in different repositories and then you pull images together to run your application to build and run your application and within the image you can then specify your base images or dependencies that are needed now let's talk about just a few more terminologies before we talk about kubernetes so um, clusters is a set of machines whether it's uh, bare metal virtualized machines they are what will actually host your applications. Now within clusters, you have nodes. Now there's different types of nodes, but in a nutshell, nodes have, nodes are a specific set of resources or a specific set of machine that will actually work to execute your processes. Now you have two types of nodes. Um, in Kubernetes, you have a master node and then a worker node. And then the master node is what controls the worker nodes and tells the different nodes to what containers and what processes to spin up and run. Now, within nodes, you have pods. Now, pods are a group of containers and they share the same storage and network resources. So 
clusters or a set of machines. Nodes are specific machines. And within, uh, within nodes, you actually have pods that run containers and pods are a group of containers. Now, in a Kubernetes cluster, you're gonna have a master node and then worker nodes. Like I said earlier, the master node will tell the worker nodes what to execute. And then within the worker nodes, you're gonna have pods and different pods will run different containers. And each pod will have a specific function. And the reason why I talk about this is because Kubernetes or another container orchestrator abstracts all of this away from the user so that you don't have to worry about this. And it pretty much automates and manages all your container or microservice applications. And some of the most common known orchestrators are Kubernetes, uh, Rancher, uh, EKS, which is um, Amazon's Elastic Kubernetes service, as uh, AKS, which is Azure's Kubernetes service. Google also has one called GKE slash Anthos. Uh, Red Hat, OpenShift has one. Docker has one called Docker Swarm, and I believe HashiCorp has one too, but you'll have a variety of container orchestrators to pick from when building your containers. And here's an actual example of a YAML file that's used to actually build a Kubernetes container. And here at the top, uh, we have the type of kind, which is the, the type of deployment option. We have the metadata, and then we have more of the specs of the image, the bottom of what actual image we're pulling for to actually run the containers or the port that we'll be able to communicate with the application as well. Now, let me quickly talk about Kubernetes really quickly, because I know Kubernetes is very popular, especially amongst containerized deployment. And when you deploy a Kubernetes, you have a pod that has a worker node and a master node. The worker node has different parts within itself. It has the kubelet, the kube proxy, and the container runtime. Uh, the kubelet is what communicates and lets you communicate back and forth. And the kube proxy is what sends out instructions. And the container runtime is the actual runtime of the container that manages the resources and that's the runtime engine now at a high level you can if you look at it from left to right you can usually communicate with your kubernetes uh, application through a user interface or command line interface if you do the ui interface it's just through click of buttons if you do the command line interface you usually use a set of commands called kube cuddle or kube um, you know, kubectl, depending on how you might say it. And then you have a control plane. The control plane is kind of like I said earlier, it's within the master nodes, like the brains of the actual application. It has a API server, a scheduler, a control manager, and all of these help you communicate to the worker nodes, help start up and schedule processes, as well as allocate resources within each node. And then within each node, you'll have different pods that actually run the containers. And the pods here are really important because they isolate the processes of the containers or they isolate the amount of resources needed to run the containers and then the containers can then run as they choose. Now, here's some key components of uh, orchestration. I won't talk about it in too much detail, but I'll cover it quickly. I told you the API service what allows you to internet, uh, interact back and forth with the clusters. The at ETCD is the uh, reliable key value store. So let's say that you know you have some secrets that you're using. It allows you to configure those properly. The kubelet is the actual um, agent that runs on the node. It helps you communicate back and forth to different nodes. And then the container runtime is the actual engine that helps you run run the actual containers. The controller, like I said earlier, it's the brains of the container. It helps you orchestrate and handle situation where nodes become unavailable. So if your application is unavailable, that's a very poor experience for your customer. This helps you, whether it's restart uh, applications or they look at how many resources and processes need. And then the scheduler also does something similar where it identifies the parameters of node and determines, hey, would when do each of these need to be run? All right. Here's a bunch of cube cuddle commands that you can use. 
It's a cheat sheet if you're interacting with Kubernetes. Like I said, you could do it through the CLI or the UI if you choose to do it through the CLI. Here's a quick cheat sheet for your guys' reference. And then let me bring it back all together. So we talked about what is containers, why are they better than VMs? They're lightweight, they're efficient, less resource consumption, things like that. Here's how an actual application looks. And here's a cluster. Uh, within this cluster, we have different nodes. We have different worker nodes and a master node. And in this case, the orchest orchestrator of choice is Kubernetes because it's a very popular orchestrator. And within each node, you can see that there's a namespace. Now, within this namespace, there are certain dependencies for the application. And the application is being ran across this. As you can see, there's two replicas, or there's one replica of the application that's used for high availability. And then you have the actual queue proxy that communicates back and forth towards the pods as well. All right. So just to let you guys know, if I confuse you at any point, it's OK. Containerization is a whole mess. There's a whole ecosystem of different applications and services and platforms and runtime provisioning and orchestrators and tools needed for containerized deployment. But the whole point is that there's a lot of different services that help you abstract this so you don't have to worry about it. And if you think that's more confusing, the vendor space for container ecosystem is even larger. So there's plenty of vendors and options to choose from depending on what you're most comfortable with and what you want to use. All right, with that, let me pass it off to Garrett to talk more about security for containerized environments after this quick 101. Hey guys, my name is Gareth. Thanks for your time. Hopefully I can help answer some of your questions. I see there's a lot in the chat and I've been trying to answer some of those, so I might look at those at the end of the session. Um, in terms of what uh, Mohit discussed, uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail around how to secure the containerized uh, microservices that will exist in your environment. So let's quickly look at what are we gonna cover in this little section. Ideally, we're gonna look at how the attack surface looks uh, different aspects of security from network, host, orchestration, and container. These all are important, and I've seen a lot of these questions coming up in the Q&A section. So hopefully these will address some of your concerns. If not, we'll try and address them at the FAQ at the end. All right, so in terms of the attack surface, this was something that was brought up by one of the people in the Q&A session, is the attack surface is quite extensive, and that is true. So with container environments, you'll obviously see there's a number of components that make up a container. It's not just a microservice, i.e. a container on its own. It's a number of extra components that need to be factored in. So one of the things we look at is the, the network itself. How do these things communicate with each other as well as to the internet and to other services within a customer's organization? We look at the physical host that is hosting all these containers as well, whether that's in a virtual space in GCP, Azure, AWS, OCI, uh, OpenShift, you pick a, a, a flavor of uh, orchestration tool or sort of virtualization platform. Uh, we need to look at how that is actually configured as well. Additionally, look at the host vulnerabilities because a number of vulnerabilities can be present in a number of different components within your organization, and this can impact your security. Uh, host application vulnerabilities themselves. So if you are using specific applications for the host itself for it to run, whether that's a process or if it's a service, et cetera, those could also have an impact on how your overall infrastructure is secured. We look at the vulnerabilities and misconfigurations of your container orchestrator as well. So if you're using native Kubernetes or any flavor of it from GKS, uh, from GKS, AKS, EKS, et cetera, there could be vulnerabilities and misconfigurations in there that were overlooked. And how do we address those? Uh, we also look at compromised container images, how you deploy your images, how you deploy your containers, uh, container vulnerabilities and their misconfigurations, as well as the container escape uh, aspect, where something could be within a container and basically uh, it's not well secured, and people can sort of laterally move within the organization from the container itself. And this also adds to a certain aspect of security that we need to address. So, if we go further and let's start looking at the attack surface itself, this is how a typical container communication flow would look uh, for most organizations, uh, just a simplistic view. You have pods, and you have the containers, and you have a cluster that um, Mohit alluded to earlier in the previous section from the basics perspective. If you look at the communication for all of these containers, excuse me, they, they run on an internal virtual Ethernet port. Uh, 
they have internal ethernet port, and then they physically connect it to a load balancer of sorts in the middle, which allows the communication to happen between pods if needed. Again, this is down to how you configure the networking aspects. And from there, that can also be directly attached to the physical nodes ethernet port and can go out to the physical internet if needed as well. <coughs> so in this case, you can see that certain communication between certain containers in a single pod can talk to each other. Generally speaking, this shouldn't be the case. They should be isolated as well. But in this scenario, container one and container two could be a front end. So container one could be a web server and the back end could be a, on container two as some sort of database that runs and store specific information for that service to run ex uh, as expected, as you can see using localhost for communication. And then container three could be an additional component of that actual infrastructure as well from a redundancy perspective or high availability. So these components exist in their own, uh, in own isolated sort of pods. Now things to also factor in is how do these communicate? Typically there's policies from a network perspective. You need to create isolation and resources you need to look at the encryption of the traffic between these components because this it could be sensitive data, depending on how this is built. We look at the Kubernetes control plane security aspects, the host itself, as we've identified, the node, that's the host. Orchestration security, so if you're using native Kubernetes, EKS, AKS, GKS, et cetera, or the container security itself. So how is the container built and what do we use on that in terms of making sure it's secure? All right, so these are just some examples of uh, network isolation that we consider as best practice. Most of this is something you guys would already know if you're in network security already, is the prevention of any, any communication. In most cases, the default policy for all resources within a Kubernetes cluster is any, any, which allows all communication to happen regardless of the namespace and where that part is located. So that means pretty much everything can talk where it's supposed to. Now, if this system was, <coughs> excuse me, hosted or publicly available, whether through DNS or static IP, you might be able to do a cross communication or lateral movement between a container to container. And you might even have full permissions that specific container to do things you're not supposed to do. So this could be a huge uh, red flag for you in terms of your configuration. Additionally, services, any services that you use in your infrastructure should be secured. You shouldn't have unnecessary services installed as well. This can be used again to either access certain resources in your environment or could allow for backwards communication if needed. So we, we try and avoid that. The containers themselves should only have necessary internet access where applicable, and that should be ingress from outside in. So if it's a web server, it should be on HTTP and HTTPS uh, and on specific ports as listed here for DNS is an example as well with 53. Um, same thing for outside in, outside traffic. Most containers shouldn't have tra internet access going out, i.e. to go and download content, etc. These containers are normally uh, destroyed after they're used and respun up as and when needed and normally are part of a sort of CI CD pipeline approach where they're constantly updated and regulated based on security requirements in your organization. So typically they shouldn't have internet access. They should be controlled from the developer perspective. Um, same thing for the pods themselves. Uh, you shouldn't have them having internet access. So these are just some basic user concepts that we should uh, factor in when building up into controls. Uh, encryption for traffic and sensitive data. Again, these are some of the most common, commonly overlooked things that people tend to forget when building their uh, orchestration infrastructure, whether it's from the worker nodes, uh, from the masters, as well as from the containers themselves, as well as the management infrastructure portion. Uh, generally, when these are built, some the most vendors will recommend that you change the default certificates as well as the encryption to something customized. And in a lot of scenarios, people tend to forget this because they just want to get the infrastructure up for testing. And a lot of times, test environments become production environments. So ideally, what we're looking at here is addressing the communication between components, i.e. IPsec for the clusters to the masters, to make sure that that cannot have any sort of man in the middle configurations. Um, again, one thing to bear in mind is obviously uh, disk encryption and uh, IPsec encryption do generally add overhead to the system and the network. So bear that in mind when considering that as an option. Also making sure that you have all the necessary certificates pre-created beforehand when doing the initial setup of your environment. A lot of times, again, like I said, this is normally overlooked. API communication between all your components the default is TLS, but there are obviously cases where you might have in a corporate environment or an enterprise environment, uh, firewalls, proxies, other sort of security devices in place. 
and the specific version of TLS that you're running might not be supported and this might not work. And so people will use port 80, so clear text uh, communication or another port to allow for that to function. So this again should be factored when using uh, or setting up these systems. All right, the other one is certificates created and deployed for the cluster and each of the components. So typically, again, you should have unique part, unique certificates for each host. So never use a wildcard, try and cre create independent certificates for each of the workers that you have and each of the master nodes that you might have in your environment. This again is good practice. So again, we're trying to make sure that you're using all communi uh, encrypted communication with all the components in your environment. All right. Uh, Kubernetes control plane, this is an important part of the Kubernetes infrastructure that you would have in your environment. Typically, if you don't have a, a centralized orchestration, you have to manually manage everything. This is not how containers are expected to be managed and run. They should be all done through orchestration of some sorts. So as you can see here, there's a couple of components that make up uh, the Kubernetes control plane. You have the perimeters and content of nodes. So these are normally the, the devices that sit at the edge of the network, which will be able to download content updates, uh, basically have internet access where needed as, as applicable. You have the masters, which are the components of the infrastructure that actually deploy your containers using Docker or others to uh, be pushed onto your environment to the workers. We have core components, which make up the Kubernetes infrastructure. We have the APIs themselves, and then obviously public facing pods, which we briefly discussed as well for internet access, or just if you want to host a service that you want people to communicate with in the public space, these particular pods are used for those specific use cases. <coughs> so again, all of these components typically don't have, do not have native security in place when they're deployed, so they're open to be exploited or attacked. So what we try and do here is consider some of the things like network, network policies as well from the Kubernetes standpoint on the workers themselves. So if you're hosting these on a Linux-based operating system, using local firewall policies on the system itself, as well as leveraging physical network infrastructure like a firewall that lives at the perimeter or at the core to help with security control as well. We have the same with uh, pod security. There are policies that you can leverage to help increase the security of the pods themselves by permitting only specific components to talk to each other, in ingress or egress. And again, we look at secrets. So you do use secrets a lot for, for communication from a console to those specific systems. We should have some sort of secrets um, key manager with encryption in place to make sure that those don't get stolen because obviously with those secret keys, they can pretty much access any resource that they have the IP to with the keys. Also looking at role-based access control, RBAC is a critical port, part of any network. So if you are going to implement this in a production environment, make sure that you consider RBAC as part of your process for implementation and security. All right, from the host security point of view, I mean, we've covered this a bit, but uh, you can see there's a number of standards, there's specific operating systems that you can leverage to help improve the security. <clears throat> these, these operating systems vary based on the, the requirement from your organization. In a lot of enterprise organizations, Linux, is not always uh, looked at as a good operating system to have because of the constraints in terms of securing it and the regular updates that need to be done because some organizations prefer to use centralized patch management solutions. In this case, you can see we are, you can leverage the different security benchmarks like NISAN, CIS, et cetera, to help with the security aspects of the host operating system to, to harden those down. These are some hardening requirements that we normally recommend, strong and unique passwords, Generating of new SSH key pairs when setting up a new host operating system, making sure the operating system is up to date with the latest patches and release versions. If you can enable, most organizations won't have this uh, ability to do automatic updates. So making sure that you have frequent updates of the OSs and the components in that to make sure that they're secure and safe. <coughs> Avoid installing any unnecessary software. Uh, obviously disable booting from external devices. This is for those of you that might have access to the physical data center or someone who may be new or might somehow gain access to the data center or the back room, could put, physically put in a bootable USB stick or hard drive and could effectively bring down the whole infrastructure. So things to consider. Uh, closing of hidden po open ports. So again, using a vulnerability scanner tool, you could basically identify on the operating system what ports are open. And from there, you can close those down and only permit what you need for the functioning of the applications in your environment. Additionally, look at scanning log files continuously. So 
you might have on the local operating system, the normal uh, user log file to see who's accessed the system over a period of time. You might want to assist, uh, regularly check those to make sure that only users that are allowed access to the system gain access. And this goes back to the role-based access control uh, discussion previously. Uh, making sure you have backups that are reliable and in a safe location, because this can also help you. And then performing security audits. This is something most organizations would no normally do quarterly or biannually. So this is something to factor in when setting up your container infrastructure. All right. From an orchestration standpoint, again, we spoke about AKS, EKS, GKS. There's a number of other ones, native Kubernetes. There's a whole bunch. Uh, these normally will have full access to all the services, the nodes, the deployment infrastructure, integrations with your pipeline tooling, uh, et cetera. Uh, it would be good to make sure that you have reg uh, regulated access control to these systems. So things that we consider important here would be SSO and multi-factor authentication, and only for those individuals that need access to those tools. So in this case, it probably would be your DevOps teams, your security team, and the person managing the infrastructure, so the, the hardware or the software owners that would make sure that they can do the patching and updates for you. Excuse me. Also, make sure that you have limited direct access to the Kubernetes nodes themselves. Because anytime you have direct access with root control, you can obviously change things and ultimately affect the production environment at that point. Uh, image and repository control. This is something that uh, Mohit brought up and uh, is very important to understand. <coughs> Excuse me. Most organizations will have standardized images and repositories that they leverage either internally or publicly. If your images are drawn from a public uh, repository, you need to make sure that those images are secure and safe. In most cases, this would mean downloading them and then basically running an antivirus scan or some sort of scan, vulnerability scan even against them to make sure that they are running the latest uh, services, operating system, software version, making sure that there's no embedded malware in them. Because again, if you're trusting a public source, you need to make sure that the public source is not going to ultimately cause your down, downside or down, demise, let's put that rather word, uh, to your organization. So repository control and image control are important things to also consider. And then code validation, before, de before deploying any software, be that an image or custom created code in your infrastructure, you need to make sure that you can scan it before it gets deployed through, the pop, through your pipeline processing to make sure that it's safe. Because otherwise you're basically uh, unknowingly deploying malicious code into your organization as well. So these are things to factor when looking at security from an orchestration perspective. All right, this goes to the container repo discussion I just had. So if you want to, you can go over this, but basically we said, try always use a trusted container registry. These are images that you know are safe, that have been scanned, are secure. Typically these are owned by you or owned by partners that you work with on a regular basis. So you can make sure that the images are safe and authorized. The other bit is obviously registry container monitoring. So you can use third party tooling to basically scan the registries to make sure that any new images that are posted there or uploaded are safe and secure. So this would require regular uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, AV scanning, sandboxing, et cetera, to run those images and make sure that they're fine. So the, re the registries and the containers themselves need to be regularly scanned. All right, uh, Kubernetes security best practices. These are, again, back to the common stuff you guys should know already from a network security perspective, authentication, authorization, and access control. The AAA is the best thing you can have in your organization. And making sure that you have this for all the different namespaces that you support and manage is critical. This will make sure that obviously no malicious actors have access to those namespaces, whether they hosted locally, internally within the organization, or publicly for people to access. Uh, keep clusters updated with reliable Docker, Docker images. So again, if you're using public uh, Docker images for the deployment of your infrastructure, please make sure that you keep those images up to date with the latest release versions, because you might be uh, posting something that might have a malicious code in through an Apache service, through SSL certificate or otherwise that uh, people can compromise. Uh, Kubernetes namespace resource quota. Again, whenever deploying a container environment, you, your namespace can also use up physical resourcing within your organization. So try and make sure that if you're creating larger containers that require more resources, i.e. CPU memory, et cetera, this space, that you have the correct quota size for the resourcing for those images. Because if you don't, they cannot be deployed and they will fail. This will cause other problems as well. 
And again, if you have users accessing them, they could do some level of buffer overflow exploit or memory exploit that would allow them access to the system based on the lack of resources. So this is something to factor in as well. And then obviously looking at network policies, making sure everything we discussed for ingress and egress traffic control is considered during your deployment as well. All right, these are just some additional documents and some videos. Uh, I believe the resources are also handed out in the resource section of the session now. So if you wanted to, you can read over these. These are some public available documents that will help you just get a bit of a crash course understanding of Kubernetes and containers for your environment. All right, now the interesting bit. How can we help you with Prisma Cloud? So what does Prisma Cloud do in terms of securing container and cloud-based resources? So as per the previous conversation from Mohit as well, we look at most applications are traditionally monolithic applications. They're very heavy. They run a number of resources. They need multiple components to make them function and run. Whereas those are now being replaced with microservices that allow organizations to uh, expand very quickly and allow their organization to actually work within the parameters of what their business needs are. You can take uh, Amazon, for example, as, a, as an example here. When they do their Black Friday as an example, they have to spin up a number of containers during Black Friday to allow for everyone like us to purchase certain items at that time of the year. And when they don't need it, they can spin it down, reducing the size of their footprint, allowing them to save money on resources that they might not need throughout the rest of the year. So that's one of the main things with the microservices. But now with that being in place, there is obviously a lot more attacks happening and this is there is some security requirements needed to make sure that these are safe. So now with uh, containers, things to obviously factor in, we've discussed this all in some level of detail right now, the attack surface. So as you saw, the attack surface now has expanded dramatically with the, with the advent of microservices. Systems can belong or be hosted anywhere in the world, not necessarily in your specific geography, nor at your physical location. The other thing is obviously with these larger attack services and all the resources that are spun up in them, we also have the lack of visibility. How do we monitor and maintain all these resources that we have now brought up in our environment to support our business. Uh, part of that also with the expansion of resources going into your environment, we have misconfigurations. Potentially the scripts you use for the deployment of these infrastructure components might not have security in mind, or you might want to do that at a later stage, but then forget about it due to other projects. So we need to also address how these are configured and make sure that there's no misconfigurations. Uh, unauthorized access, again, back to the AAA, RBAC, SSO, MFA situation. Most resources, people forget or tend to forget about security and who's accessing these resources. So we need to make sure that those are secure. And then lastly, we look at the supply chain attacks. So how we actually are deploying our software through our CI CD pipeline toolings to the different cloud providers that we use or leverage. So making sure that all our software and our systems are secure from day zero to the last day of their use, that they're secure uh, from day one. So when we look at Prisma Cloud, Prisma Cloud has multiple approaches to how we address this with multiple capabilities with inside the CNAP platform that we have. We obviously cover uh, vulnerability management, compliance governance, WAS, runtime protection through our workload protection aspects, CD security through our uh, workload protection and our uh, application security components, malware scanning as well, infrastructure as code security and threat intelligence streams that we pull from our multiple data sources, including our own. And additionally, we also support multiple platforms and we also support agent and agentless based security as well, allowing some granular controls for customers that require it, depending on your use case needs. All right, so when we look at the complete uh, protection from code to cloud, we look at what is, where do we start? Typically we start with infrastructure as code for some customers that are more DevOps uh, specific. We would have our code security application integration, which allows us to check your code images before being deployed or being replicated to your respective repos that you use or support uh, and what we support and integrate with. You then obviously have the deployment aspects where we look at code security as well. So we look at scanning our images, making sure that they're trusted from the repos that we are, are leveraging. CD security from the deployment perspective, they're making sure that whatever we deploy is actually what we say it is and based on our compliance standard and policy requirements, access control to those resources, making sure only those that need to access the cloud infrastructure or the components is there. And obviously doing sandboxing for malware analysis to make sure that those images aren't effectively 
pre uh, malicious and not going to comp uh, affect us environments. And then we go to the runtime aspect, uh, the run aspect, which is our compliance aspect, where we look at security posture management, and we cover compliance, governance, vulnerability management, runtime protection, whereas an API security, which are all key components for a secure uh, VM infrastructure or a container containerized security infrastructure. So one of the things that you will experience if you are a Prisma Cloud customer or going to be a Prisma Cloud customer is that once you onboard all these components, you will see a large volume of alerts. Now, the main thing is how do we prioritize these alerts and what do we do to address that? So this is something that we see a lot of in the field from our customers. So one, one of the things that we would help our customers doing through using our uh, AI and machine learning capabilities in the product is to reduce the number of zero, zero day vulnerabilities or at least address them so you can see them more effectively within the product and help you concentrate your efforts on what you need to do. So we will just go through here as an example of a vulnerability that you would typically see in your environment. This is still relative today, the Log4j, Atlassian, Apache, and Spring Framework uh, vulnerabilities. You can see these are remote code executions that could happen in your environment. Uh, again, these are very popular still today. A lot of companies haven't patched these. Some customers still need to require legacy code for certain aspects of the organization to function. With Prisma Cloud, we can effectively virtually patch these using our WAS solution. We can identify these through our uh, misconfiguration capabilities and our sandboxing capabilities. Also through code deployment, if we identify that these exist based on policy, we can prevent those packages from being deployed in your environment, giving you the opportunity and your DevOps teams to change those versioning to the latest releases, which would be secure. Additionally, we have workload protection, which if it identified these capabilities would prevent the communication from those systems, either ingressing or egressing your organization or block those systems altogether if needed based on your policies in your organization. All right, so common methods that we use for blocking or prioritizing specific uh, severities or, or malicious code in your organization or events, we'll be using CVS score, which is typically what we use a lot of the times. We look at the highest score, but we also take into consideration your environment. So. How would this affect your environment? So if we have a high CVS score and your organization is in production, we might just alert on that particular CVS or CVSS vulnerability and let you know that it exists, but not block it. So that way you can still function as expected. Other one is also to make sure that it's not exploited. We could use virtual patching functionality or capabilities with our WAS solution. Additionally, we can also look at doing virtual remediation through uh, our product as well. This helps you to identify the risk as well as resolve it as needed. Okay, so risk-based prioritization, typically this is how we look at it from a pyramid perspective. We take what is the most commonly exploited in the wild and we take what was least or not most effective as well. And we try and reduce the score by giving you the stuff that's most important to you. So anything that's lower risk, typically it's not to say it doesn't, it's not risky, it's still important to consider, but it's not critical for you to address at this immediate moment. So through the tooling, we allow you the option to see what is key to your organization to remediate now. We also give you information about those specific attacks and see whether or not there is any compensating control or there's any patches that could be implemented based on exposure where that system res resides in your organization as well. So if there is a fix for it, we let you know. You can then obviously do necessary remediation accordingly, either through automation or manually as needed uh, from your organization's perspective. This is an example of our prioritization funnel, which we have in the latest release of Prisma Cloud. As you can see, it takes the approach of how many vulnerabilities have we identified. As you can see from here, there was 5,000 vulnerabilities initially identified through our learning model. We've now reduced that down again to 600, which are, if I'm just reading now, urgent. <laughs> which means they need to be they need to be looked at, but they're not going to break your infrastructure as needed. You have 60 that are exploitable. These are ones that we need to really factor in and look at. We have, of those 60, we have 50 that are patchable. So 10 of those cannot be patched. So that would basically say that we need to uh, address that with the vendors of choice and ask them to look at how they're going to remediate that for us with a patch solution or option. And then we can obviously address the ones that are key to us at that point with the funnel at the bottom. Again, as an example on the right, it shows you the impact of those CVEs based on the funnels on the left. These are all drill down information. So this could be seen by you or your user or your analysts 
while doing their uh, investigations in the cloud security side of things. Garrett, yeah, let me add one thing. Um, yep. I think last year or in the year 2023, about like 23 or 24,000 new CVEs were introduced. Now that's one CVE every 15 minutes. Imagine trying to resolve that many vulnerabilities. Um, so like Garrett said, how Prisma Cloud does it is we help you prioritize based off looking at all the vulnerabilities, the criticals and highs, then looking at which ones you need to fix now, which ones are exploitable, meaning that there is an actual exploit in the wild that is available to exploit the vulnerabilities out of those, which one can actually be fixed and out of those, which ones are actually being used because just because it can be fixed doesn't mean you're actually using them in your environment or your containerized applications. We want to make sure you have like a list of five versus a list of 5,000 you can take action on. Yeah. Um, okay, where were we? Oh yeah, so now based on what Mahit just discussed as well, this also gives a visual uh, a visual view of what the vulnerability looks like as an example. When we drill down into the CVE data that we were seeing on the right-hand side, if you click on that, it actually gives you more of the uh, attack surface of what's actually happening. So you can actually see the CVE, where in the, the cloud deployment sort of scenario you are, whether you're in the code build phase, whether in the deploy phase or the run phase, where those systems are hosted and which systems those are that potentially could be compromised. And each of these resources, either the code side, the host or the runtime, the container itself can be drilled down and you can actually identify what's going on from that, that specific use case. So this helps you actually see whether or not you're deploying it correctly, building it correctly, or if you have the policies in place to make sure that it's secure and it's not being compromised at the runtime phase. Okay, um, in terms of prioritization and focusing on important issues, again, we've kind of re we've kind of reiterated that or at least Mohit gave a really good explanation about that from the prioritization perspective. You can see here that all the data that we bring into Prisma Cloud comes from multiple sources, whether it's from the CSPM perspective using Cloudmas configurations, network exposure anomalies and threats, whether it's the CWP aspect where we're looking at secrets exposure where your secrets are uh, not secured, whether your workloads are vulnerable, where you have access, excessive permissions or suspicious user behavior through our, through our Kim modeling or DSPM where we look at sensitive data and data at risk where we look at uh, uh, data that's actually being stored either in a public place or is moving around your organization which could potentially be at risk by man in the middle tax, et cetera. We also take into consideration correlation as part of our modeling to help identify all the data points that we're bringing in to give you an accurate view of the tax surface or the tax path in this case your specific system and that's certain vulnerabilities. So that way we know exactly these vulnerabilities are not just randomly identified and could be attached to any machine. We know exactly which machine or which container they're actually attached to. And from there we can address it accordingly. Uh, additionally, as you can see from the prioritization perspective, how are we doing this? So we're taking in, in this case, billions of data sets from multiple log sources. And then we're funneling that down and giving you the relevant data that's important for you in that specific scenario so that you can make sure you're addressing the key vulnerabilities of the key exploits in your organization rather than having to try and figure it out on your own. So that's one of the key aspects of Prisma Cloud that you also get from the platform. All right, and this is the example here, just the visualization. As you can see, we have a container, it's a Kubernetes workload. It has internet access, so there's ingress traffic coming in from a Prisma Cloud unknown source that's publicly exposed. You can see there's un high, unusually high data volume, so this is obviously having a storage bucket of sorts. In this case, it's an S3 bucket in Amazon, and this bucket is probably not encrypted, nor is it uh, uh, having role-based access of some level of security that prevents users accessing it. You'll also see that admin access is privileged access. So this particular container can access any resource within the organization as well. And we can see the container itself has a critical vulnerability that was identified through the workload. And then the last bit is the PI storage. So there is personal information data that's stored in the S3 bucket, which then could also be exfiltrated from the specific, specific container. Now, there's a lot of ways we can resolve this. Using Prisma Cloud, there's, there's components within the tool we can use to, to remediate this, but again, this might be in a dev environment and you might not be really worried. This might be an active penetration test that you've paid for to actually identify this and give you some more insights. 
So depending on your use case, this data is very helpful for identifying and resolving those risks. All right, and then the last little bit is obviously how we make sure that we are the best in breed. You can see through all of these different Forrester, uh, Gigamon, and so on awards, we have won a number of uh, awards for our security platform. And uh, again, this is a good excuse for you to look at Prisper Cloud if you haven't already looked at it uh, in the past. And thank you very much for this session. Again, I'll leave that to uh, the team now to help with the FAQs. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> I was trying to answer them. I couldn't answer all of them. Um, there's a question asking within Polyton Network's product ecosystem, uh, Prisma Cloud has a product for container security. Are there any container security features in CSPM? Uh, CSPM has uh, the agentless uh, component, which you can allow for some level of protection as well without deploying an agent itself. Uh, we do have obviously the vulnerability and threats aspects as well. So we do look at that from the CSPM perspective, but in terms of active control, uh, the, the CSPM is not intended to be an active control component of Prisma Cloud. You would still need to leverage CWP. Um, the term container runtime, I think we will answer these ones. Let me look at the new questions, sorry. Um, if I were an architect, how could I determine which is the best for an application containerized or modular monolithic architecture? Recently, there have been many complaints about containerization, particularly regarding its expense and the difficulty of monitoring. In some cases, a modular monolithic architecture might be a better option. Which are these cases? So in, in some cases, yes, uh, monolithic applications still have their place and they would serve you well if your organization is internal. So if you particularly, let's say, example, you're a federal customer or government of some sorts around the world, you might not want your architecture to be exposed to the internet and cloud infrastructure might not be permitted based on regulations in your region. In that case, a monolithic architecture would work better for you. And in that scenario, we would obviously recommend our Prisma Cloud Compute Edition, which is on-prem. And that would obviously help with some of the security aspects that you're trying to address there. Uh, same thing for the normal security stuff that we briefly touched on. You would still have to go through the same security controls when building your internal infrastructure uh, as well. So still use encryption, still use uh, role-based access and so on, depending on your trust levels within your organization for the people you work with. So that's something to factor in. What are some ways devs can bypass build overhead in a containerized microservice architecture for rapid uh, prototyping, hot reloads in running a container, for example? So for the, the build cycle of things, typically, if you're going to do that, we wouldn't use the security in, in, a, in a prototyping aspect to begin with. Once you've come up with a more secure container environment that you want to deploy, then we would introduce the container application security function from Prisma Cloud as an example. That would tie in with your RDE. And then from there, we can actually address the code as you're being as you're developing it to make sure that you're following the correct standards. There is policies around that. And that could then be pushed to your organization safely. Uh, in terms of the hot reloads in a running container, you, you could do that still. The scans will obviously be ignored at that point for that specific image. But once the scans are rerun, they will readdress that specific memory and they will identify if there is any risk in that. So, you might not be able to bypass it per se, but it still will be scanned if it's integrated. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, in an application with microservices sprawl, how to manage any Linux kernel dependencies that might exist among the different microservices? Well, through workload protection, we can obviously identify the kernel dependencies that are running. And through the CSPM model with misconfiguration and the containers themselves or the host themselves, we can identify if there's any uh, related um, misconfiguration slash applications being out of date. Uh, and this from a microservice perspective would be then alerted on, and then you would have to rebuild based on the recommendations from the product. That's one option. The other one is obviously working with your DevOps teams to uh, identify what their prerequisite is in terms of kernel dependencies and versions. And then you would have to work with them on the build for that. Uh, but again, this is dependent on each and every application that you build from your microservice perspective. Uh, MTLS internal communication and an IASTIO for interpart communication. Um, 
or uh, I don't know. Yes, we can use them. It depends on the the container orchestration tooling that you use. Uh, to be honest, they're different for different ones. Um, but if you elaborate a bit more, we can obviously try to answer that question in more detail. Uh, how do we resolve or stop false positive results in Prisma? Typically, you would have to raise a case with our support team. You would also you have to take data logs from the, the platform itself and submit that to support. And from there, they can identify and address the false positives. It depends on which false positives you're talking about. Usually, we don't have uh, too many false positives. I think you're trying to prioritize risk, use attack paths to prioritize risk. But uh, usually, we don't have false positives in Prisma Cloud. Yeah. Uh, is Prisma Cloud FedRAMP certified? Also, is there an option for managing false positives? Uh, Prisma Cloud, to a certain degree, is FedRAMP certified. We have quite a few federal customers using Prisma Cloud. Mm -hmm. um, for the false positives, as per the previous question, if you have any, you can submit tickets, and we would obviously take that into consideration and help address those when we find them, when you find it. Um, and uh, any other questions? <laughs> um, no, but Gare. Yep, that looks like all the questions we've got. Mohit, sorry to cut you off there. What was yeah, that? I was going to say, uh, Prisma Cloud just uh, entered. So we are FedRAMP, but we are now moving towards FedRAMP High. So we are in the process of obtaining FedRAMP High. All right. Well, well, guys, that looks like all the time that we have today. Um, was there anything that you'd, you'd like to say to our audience before we actually close things out or kind of any any final words to, to leave us on? I would say uh, if you guys have any questions beyond this, feel free to add Gareth or I on LinkedIn. Feel free to bug us and any questions. Sorry, Gareth, for putting you out there. If that's okay. No, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. And if you guys have any feedback, let us know as well. We're very open to hearing what you guys have to say. <laughs> I think All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Gareth and, and Mohit, thank you both so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure meeting you and, and hearing from you over this past hour. So once again, thank you so much for joining us on Tech Strong Learning. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us, Cody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. So so before I release our audience, just a couple of final notes. Um, this was recorded and you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find it living on the Cloud Native Now website. That's cloudnativenow.com slash webinars. We'll be contacting two of our most engaged attendees to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So thank you so much for your participation today. Um, it's not too late to become eligible. If you would just like to fill out that post webinar survey that is both in the handouts and pinned to the top of the chat, um, you have that chance of being selected as well. I'd like to thank Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring our program. And to our audience, thank you so much for being here for the duration of our time today. Um, we really appreciate your time, and we hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>